and you've uh, pulled the husks back on all the ones that I picked. Yeah, but we haven't finished picking the other stuff because it's too wet. Too wet. We got three quarters of an inch of rain in that rain gauge over there. Well, they say it was at least eight days between eight and nine tenths in North Battleford. I need to cultivate my garden, but it's too wet now. Sure is. And it'll probably dry off, but it might not. I hope it does. <laughs> Is always the first ones that there. ripen. And these guys are, yeah, I'll just keep This is a tomato called Midnight Snack, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. You do remember correctly. I'm impressed. Mmm. And it's purple in color on the outside only. Mmm. I rarely take bites of cherry tomatoes because it usually makes a mess, but this one doesn't, so. Yeah, mine did. <laughs> I am Rochelle Turnier. I am Jim Turnier and I'm your father. Yeah, and we run Prairie Garden Seeds and we're here on our farm in Treaty 6 territory in Saskatchewan, uh, just on the edge of Murray Lake. And this is a farm that I grew up on. My dad's parents came here in the 30s and they left southern Saskatchewan during the drought, the dirty 30s, uh, and looked for a location with water so that they could irrigate vegetables and so that's how we ended up in this gorgeous location. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yes, there is seed. There's a couple of seeds in it. Prairie Garden Seeds has been operating since about 1986. My dad started um, gathering seeds and offering them for sale. We aren't certified organic but we don't use any agricultural chemicals. The land that we're on is about 80 acres. Our gardens are anywhere from three to five, depending on how ambitious we're feeling in the spring. We also have a wonderful garden location. It's a warm and sheltered microclimate. It has very good soil, a little short on rainfall, but we manage with that. And because of our wonderful soil and climate, there are all kinds of things that every year will seed themselves. So. As you walk through the garden, you'll see quite a few flowers. We didn't put them there, they put themselves there. There's a, a ground cherry here that has produced all kinds of good fruits that seeds itself. We'll notice these things and try to leave some of them there. There's the biodiversity that exists in our collection and then there's the biodiversity that we have in our garden each season, which is not the same because in our garden each season, we're growing a fraction of what our collection actually holds uh, because we can't grow everything every year. We're in the Prairie Garden Seeds seed storage room. So we grow about 95% of the seeds in our collection. And here we store all of our seeds, dry, cool, in the dark. Um, well, a seed is contains a living, breathing embryo. And that little plant is living and breathing the whole time in storage. And it's slowly using up the energy it has saved up in that seed to wait until the right conditions are around so that that embryo can grow and pop out of the seed coat. So moisture, light, and heat. So you want the exact opposite for seed storage because the slower that embryo is using up the energy, the longer that life of the seed will be in storage. Once they're processed and cleaned, they come and live here until they get packaged to be sent out to customers. So the process of getting seeds from growing them, producing them, and getting them into packages is very intricate and complicated because we have so many different crops. Seeds are produced in dry capsules, pods. Uh, some things are in wet fruits. There's a lot of fiddly work. Well, this is one of these beans and I'm gonna just get in this tub and tramp on it, which is probably a pretty traditional way of turning your, your plants into seeds. These pods are, are lovely and dry, 
We harvested them probably two or three weeks ago. They've been sitting indoors all that time. So all you do is step on a, a bean pod and it pops open. This is called winnowing. And if you had a combine, you would have a, a machine turning a fan doing the same thing. But this is a pretty traditional way that farmers used to do it before we had pulse tools. I am processing tomatoes for seed. I take the tomatoes, I wash them all, I cut out all the bad spots on them and the stem area. Cut that tomato in half and just squeeze out the middle. And then this beautiful juicy mixture here, I will let it sit to ferment for three days. And after the third day, I will wash those seeds. They will have shed their little jelly sack because this mixture is of course a little bit goopy and then I let it sit for a couple weeks to dry out of direct sunlight. And then we rub it and screen it and put it in an envelope in our seed storage, ready to package and go to customers. Pelissier Durham, where's that one? Oh boy, maybe this one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lovely wheat. Yeah, and this one's the Jason einkorn. Oh, okay. Oh, so it's Egyptian, Egyptian. I guess yes. you called it, yeah. Well, some of the people who buy wheats from us are simply collectors and they're, I guess, an international group and they, they, they buy and they swap and they share and so wheats have come from all over and it's, it's, it's wonderful to do so because all these old wheats are still available somewhere. Presently, there's a huge push by multinational corporations to control all the seeds that are produced in the world. It obviously could be very profitable to them. They would control the food supply. Luckily, the National Farmers Union has been the strongest voice in Canada for farmers being able to save their own seed. And I think we have been successful in the past in preventing a greater takeover of seeds by corporations, but they don't stop trying, so we have to keep being that voice here in Canada. There's something called the Open Source Seed Initiative, which is a movement that is emphasizing the importance of leaving seeds in the public domain. And there's a pledge that goes with those seeds saying you will not restrict other people's access to them or their derivatives. Plants have been bred over 10,000 years of history of agriculture and no one owns them and no one should be able to own them. So we've got one of the most um, diverse fava bean collections, it, publicly accessible fava bean collections, probably in the world. We have about 30 different varieties of broad beans. So this is one of the largest seeded ones, Aprovecchio Select. And so it's got very, very big seeds that are blonde mostly. Black Russian fava. There's another really fun fava here because it's a mixture of colors. It's called Ayanto's Return, and so there's some purples in there, some tan. I built up a reasonably good collection of seeds before Rochelle started working with me, and now it's pretty important that someone carry on growing and sharing these seeds so they keep actively playing a role in feeding the, the world. I think that there are many reasons why it's important for us to stay around and I have a gift with being so blessed to be on the land that I'm on and be in the family that I'm in. It's done such great, radical, important work. It's now Rochelle's baby and I work with her, for her, and so we see what we can get done together.